Hey there, welcome back. Today we'll be talking about building a simple story viewer, you know, the kind you see on apps like Instagram and Snapchat. It's an app that gives you a slideshow experience of the most relevant photos. When you open the app, you're greeted with a full screen photo that automatically moves on to the next one after 10 seconds or with just a simple swipe. And the photos are ephemeral, which means they expire 24 hours after posting. Every time you swipe, the next photo is determined by the most recently posted unseen. And when you've reached the end of the line, the app takes you back to the very first story. It's like a never-ending cycle of deja vu. Take a look at the mock-up. Each story has a photo, the author's profile picture and name, and a timestamp so you know when it was posted. And because we don't want you to miss a beat, the app should work in offline mode too, so you can keep swiping even when you don't have the internet. Let's move on to the non-functional requirements. We have four important things to consider. Our app's UI should have reasonable performance. We should optimize for slow internet connections, limited storage on the user's device, and we shouldn't overload the backend with too many useless requests. All right, now let's look at the solution plan. We'll start with the data model of our application, which should be pretty straightforward, just like solving a Rubik's cube. Then we'll discuss the API design and different approaches we could use here. After that, we'll tackle the UI implementation. Next, we'll do a high-level design of our system, discussing the relationships between objects and the data flow. And at the end, we'll go over image fetching and any remaining architectural questions. Let's start with the data model. We have only one entity today, the photo class, that represents our stories. It has the following properties photo ID, unique object identifier, photo URL, a link to download the image file, profile peak URL, a link to the avatar image file of the story author, author's name, created at, timestamp of when the photo was posted, and expire at, timestamp of when the photo expires and shouldn't be shown to the user. Okay, I think that covers the data model, so let's move on to the juicy topic of the API. We need to download a list of photos to show. In our server response, we'll return only the metadata without the image files themselves. I see two possible solutions for this problem, this pagination and without. Let's start with the first approach. We'll use a cursor-based pagination. For those who are interested in learning more about different types of pagination, check out my video about the Instagram newsfeed design. All right, you have three possible cases, initial load, our first load of stories with no data. Head load, loading newly posted stories with a page size and a cursor as parameters. And tail load, loading older stories with a page size and cursor as parameters. The game changing requirement here is that the next photo should be determined by the most recently posted unseen. This means that we need to periodically pull data from the server to see if we have any newly posted stories. If we do, we should show them first, even before the old ones that are already downloaded. Let's take a look at the example. Let's imagine we have a timeline from 8 to 12 p.m. and it's currently 9 p.m. I'll draw a dotted line to indicate the current time. And we have stories posted at different times, at 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. Let's assume that the request page size is 3, which means we only receive 3 stories at a time from the server. So we'll receive three stories and then go offline for a few hours. At 12 p.m. we go back to the app and we need to show the most recently posted photos. So we'll have to do a head load for them. But we have six new stories and the page size is only three. So we will get three newly posted photos and we'll have a gap between them. So after the head load we'll have to do multiple tail loads until the gap is gone. This type of pagination logic can be extremely complicated. It would also be a hassle to store the data as we would have to do it in batches. But what if I told you there is an easier way to implement this story request? Let's forget about pagination and receive all stories at once. And periodically, say once every 10 minutes, request deltas with fresh photos. This way, we'll have only one method, get stories after, with a single parameter, the cursor. The first time we request, we won't pass this parameter, 
and we will get a list of all available stories in 24 hours. Next, we'll save the cache timestamp and for 10 minutes we will not pull the server to avoid overloading it with requests. And after 10 minutes we'll make another request and pass the ID of the most recent photo on the client as a cursor to the API method. The server will then return all photos that are newer than this one, which will merge on the client and display to the user. You probably have a reasonable question in your head. Won't the server's response be too heavy? Let's do the math. The size of one photo object is approximately 100 bytes. Let's assume the average user has 500 friends and a quarter of them have posted something in the last 24 hours. On average, each person has posted four stories. That means the total size would be 100 multiplied by 500 multiplied by one quarter and by four equals to 50,000 bytes or 50 kilobytes, which is a reasonable size for a single request from a phone. Great. Now let's see what happens with this logic on the timeline. We'll have the same number of posts as in the case of pagination, but this time we will request all elements from 0 to 3 at once with the first request. After a few hours, we'll receive all new photos in a new request. This logic is much simpler, but you'll still need to be careful about correctly sorting the data on the client. Let's use this approach for our app. All right, let's talk about downloading images. When it comes to images, they can be huge in size. That's why we shouldn't embed the photo directly in the API's metadata response. The solution here is distributed file storage, such as Amazon S3. We'll store the images there, and in our photo response, we'll only attach a link to the object in storage. This will fix the problem. Now, let's move on to the user interface. It's a pretty interesting topic after all. We need to implement a full screen photo viewer that auto advances every 10 seconds or when swiped. And here's the catch. We need to be able to return to the first image after reaching the last one with a normal swipe. So what options do we have? Well, there is a UI collection U, UI page view controller and a regular UI view controller with multiple UI image views and a swipe gesture recognizer. In other words, manual implementation. The issue with UI collection view is that it's a bit of pain to seamlessly rewind from the last image to the first one without some workarounds. The standard UI collection view animation won't cut it. UI page view controller has the same problem. Plus, animations of transitions between view controllers are poorly supported. Therefore, I will use UI view controller and three UI image views. Take a look at this mockup. When we swipe, we'll just move the third UI image view to the place of the second and rearrange the first one to the place of the third. This way, we won't have to create new UI image views every time. We'll just move them with animation and change the images. How to implement the movement? Well, we'll add a swipe gesture recognizer and move the view as the user moves their finger. If we move the photo more than 50% of the screen, the animation will be completed even if the user removes their finger. It is also important to realize the ability to make a quick and short swipe. It will trigger flipping to the next page. You also need to remember that every 10 seconds the photo needs to be automatically scrolled to the next one. That means that we'll need a special timer that will count down 10 seconds from the moment the photo was downloaded and displayed on the screen. There is a temptation to start the timer immediately after the transition, but that's incorrect, because the photo might not have loaded yet. Alright, now let's move on to the high-level design of our system. Today I've decided to use MVP as the architecture for the presentation layer of the application. Take a look at the diagram. I know it looks similar to MVC, but there is a key difference. The view controller is now considered a view, which means it will only include view-related code. Most of the logic will be in the presenter, including responding to users' actions and updating the UI. And the most important part, our presenter won't be UI kit dependent, meaning it will be well isolated and easily testable. And the models are just representations of our data. Super, let's now take a look at the high-level design scheme. 
On the left, we have the main application blocks, and on the right, the backend, which has a REST API and image storage. Our application follows the MVP architecture and features a basic UI view controller with three UI image views to display the stories. The view controller has a presenter as a dependency, whereas the main business logic resides. The data source is stored in the presenter and cached there for 10 minutes. If the cache becomes obsolete or doesn't exist at all, the presenter uses the photo service dependency, which is responsible for receiving data and orchestrating the work of the storage and network client, which makes API requests. Photo service also has a dependency called photo orderer, this is a separate entity that will contain the story sorting logic. This is convenient because we delegate the sorting policy to a separate entity and if desired, we can easily change it. As storage, we can take core data as a standard solution for iOS applications, or we can simply implement the codable protocol for our photo entity, serialize photos into JSON files and store them on disk. Okay, how can all these dependencies be put together? We use a dependency injection container, specifically the Swinject library, to build dependencies. Swinject is a lightweight dependency injection framework for Swift apps. It allows you to split your app into loosely coupled components, which can then be maintained and tested more easily. The view controller is the root of our dependency graph, and the necessary services and dependencies are inserted into it, allowing us to achieve the dependency inversion principle and make our code more testable. Let's examine the data flow in the app for clarity. The view controller requests data from the presenter, who then checks the cache. If it is not useful, the presenter pings the photo service. The photo service assembles the request parameters and uses network client to access the API, where it retrieves 30 stories. The photo service parses these stories and transfers them to a photo order. The photo order creates a data source object with properties such as sorted view models, an array of view models, and next view model, the next photo to be shown to the user. The data source also has the mark as seen method, which allows marking photos as viewed. This object is then transferred to the presenter and cached there for 10 minutes. Imagine a user views 15 stories and goes offline for some time. When they come back, we need to show them new stories first. We pass the current data source to the photo service, which requests 10 new stories from the server. Using the photo order, the photo service creates a new data source with 40 stories 15 of which are marked as viewed. The next view model property changes as we first need to show the recently posted picture. This data source is passed to the presenter who uses a view controller to display everything. To summarize, the photo service class has two methods, the get initial stories method and the get updated stories method for requesting updated data. Let's talk about how to fetch and store images efficiently. When the user closes and reopens the application, we don't want to re-download the images. To solve this, we have two options for caching, an SURL cache provided by Apple or a third-party library such as SD Web Image. SD Web Image is a good choice because it downloads images in a background thread, avoiding blocking the main thread, and this caches the images for future use. It also allows for clearing the cache based on time or space constraints. In comparison, an SURL cache implements disk caching of raw HTTP responses, but every time the image is retrieved from the cache, it must be transformed into UI image. On the other hand, SD Web image caches the UI image representation, saving the overhead of the transformation. That's why I'll go with SD Web image. Also, we need to dive into the world of prefetching images and how it can improve user experience. Imagine scrolling through a story viewer and not having to wait for a loading spinner to disappear before seeing the next photo. That's the power of prefetching. 
is UI Collection View, we receive this functionality for free as methods of the UI Collection View data source prefetching protocol. But for our solution, we need to request not just the photo that's on the screen, but also the next one. Great, we've covered most of the core architecture problems of the story viewer. What else can you be asked at the interview? The interviewer can dive into the topic of story expiration. Here you could tell about the timestamp check on the client that you're going to implement for this. There may also be a conversation about pushing new content actively instead of polling the backend every 10 minutes. It could lead to a discussion of push notifications or sockets. And let's not forget about supporting video stories, because why settle for just still images when you can have a moving ones too? So that's it for today's video. If you liked it, give it a like and leave some comments. I'd love to answer any questions you may have about architecture. And as always, thank you for watching and have a great day.